log report started. Oh, you did. It's December 7th, 2020. At zero seven sixteen hundred hours. Earth time. Let's see, all is he? Come on there. We are John C. of Starbucks 53. Long way of Starfleet. Hmm. Ha ha. All right, enough of the damn theatrical acting at this point over here. Weaver, John C. Rose, California. And yes, to put it back in regular Earth terms, at this point over here, December 7th, 2020. It is 16 after 7 in the morning. And you notice the damn get-up at this point. Well, it's still cold outside as hell. I've already wasted about three minutes worth of a good audio recording at this point over here, trying to get shit taken care of here. I came across an, es- an essay and Facebook responses. Every once in a while, I'll run into this kind of situation where I'm having people argue the semantics, theories, the universe, and everything else concerning about the topic of Star Trek. Oh my God, I'm going crazy at this point. Get the damn glasses off here for a minute. Okay. Why am I talking about this damn thing in the first place? Why? 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 Well, it beats talking about the other things in the first place, so. I haven't read this one gentleman's essay or another guy's book. There's a hell of a lot of essays and books written about this over the past 50 years concerning about the merits of a sci-fi show created by a gentleman named of Gene Roddenberry that people actually adore and almost put him into a status of either a saint or a god. And to me, it was just a guy trying to survive. But the thing of it is, his vision that he had for the future was ringing too close to home to a lot of people. He created a universe where a future utopia possibly exists and people have very little interest in money and they are part of a federation of planets and they are expanding their borders, they're exploring things, they're getting into border clashes. They're talking about things that happen to us and that we're trying to find peaceful ways to solve them if not using a, the butt of a phaser at this point. I want to put it bluntly and put it mildly at this point. And this one gentleman who was a war survivor, either by Korean or World War II, I'm not quite sure which, because I still got to delve into the further history of this gentleman here. He was also a Los Angeles police officer. And with all, of her, with all the stuff he's been experiencing and stuff he's read, I suppose he had the writer's bug biting him, and he butt, biting him in all over the place worse than a bed bug infestation, to where he came up with the idea of wagon train to the stars where you have a Horatio Hornblower at the helm. Clearly, see, Forrest was, uh, was a big influence on him. On me, too. Not only in the later adult life, not as a kid, because I never read the guy. I wish I had. It would have been a hell of a read. But his vision of what the future should have been like is resonating. He wrote a screenplay, sent it out, somehow or another. He got developed, and we had Star Trek premiering in September of 1966. Don't ask me specific dates, either 6 or 9. On NBC, in black and white where people are coming across another science fiction show, among others that have already been out there in the first place. But he was trying to promote something that was totally above the top of everybody. And you had to understand during that time they had monster scare. Science fiction was considered monsters versus man. I mean, there was a lot of interpretations to do this damn thing. And... uh, we had the Communist Red Scare going on at this point over here. 
We've also had people freaking out because of war, civil unrest, civil rights violations left and right. Uh, conflict started because we didn't want the Red Scare to continue dominating the world. Oh, the domino theory. Oh, my God. Oh, there's a lot of things going on during that time. A lot of things ugly and hideous to us. But no, this one man was trying to be a golden vision about it. Either he had a vision about it or he was trying to get into the writing field of screenwriting and publishing his works. So I have to admit that Gene Roddenberry was putting out feelers and scripts out there for certain shows to be produced, and he did get them out there. A lot of them crash and burn. A few of them got picked up. But the one that made a delible difference, and people fought like hell to keep it up for at least three seasons before it finally lost chugging. And then the reruns picked up on it for 79 episodes and continue to this day of 2020. Different manifestations, different books, different artistic impressions, cartoons, animations, films, books, a lot of things concerning about it. Fandoms coming up, creation conventions going up. I mean, it turned out to be one huge universe in itself of just a fandom itself, trying to extrapolate from 79 episodes of what Roddenberry was trying to tell people, and not to mention the subsequent shows afterwards to explain, to, to go beyond the boundaries of what he's done, to extrapolate more and more. Trying to find the big ass words to say at this point over here, making one little show that chugged for nearly three seasons and would have died and just left in obscurity. The thing is, this realm expanded, Ex- expounded, if we want to use big such words. If there is such a word, so I just expound it, but I might as well use the damn thing in the first place. I mean, out there, holy moly. Give me a few minutes. I got a dog that needs to be taken out. I'm talking about science fiction, and then I got a reality check here. Sorry sorry about the pause of real life interfering with everything else these days. So... One gentleman creates a universe. He didn't want to see war. He didn't want to see the poverty. He didn't want to see the social injustice. But he had to make his point clear to people in a form, in a fashion that people took it to heart. The problem is, a lot of people shared his vision, but not enough of it. A small from a start group of diehard fans who wrote letters and formed their own clubs. And diehard people who continue the work to this day to expand the lessons of what Gene Ron Mary was trying to tell us. Then again, what everybody else kept trying to tell each other, and unfortunately we weren't listening during that time. Now, the fans look at the work and tear the damn thing apart, left to right, like the jackals and wolves and God knows what else. And I'm looking back in a historical point of view of how and why the thing was starting in the first place. I mean, I can see the historical context of what happened during that time. And it was a very turbulent time. And we have gotten ourselves into too many damn wars throughout our life. And struggle with a hell of a lot of social issues that we just fail to address it in a more civilized way. And possibly it was interpreted in one particular fashion that Star Trek was going to be one of those ways. Unfortunately, some people have taken it to a point of gospel. Just about deifying this one writer to the point of above anybody else, maybe? I mean, the universe he's created is 
comparable to another woman who created a universe in her own head while she was in poverty, and now she's a multimillionaire with a universe in herself has been about 20, 25 years, uh, about 30 years. And now it's expanded more and more on that. Fandom is tricky. Fandom is a life itself. Fandom is a universe in itself. I fear sometimes it's also a religion in itself as well. I know. I caught up in it when I was growing up as a kid. I had watched the shows. I had watched Star Trek and seen the episodes again and again and again and again. So you don't have to tell me about being a lifetime Trekkie. Excuse me one second. You don't have to explain to me what it is to be a Trekkie. At the time, I thought I knew what a Trekkie was. Guys expanding the world of some other writer's world and trying to expound upon the and expand upon the theories revolving around this world. And basically, it was just wagon trains and stars. Horatio Hornblower, if you wanted to look at it that way. Or if you want to look at it a different way, a utopia. A utopia. Just how far in the utopia realm are we willing to go at this point over here to the beyond the point of worshipping? I mean, worshipping. Okay? The hat. The sweater. You think that's not enough? I'm getting this thing off. Give me a second. Getting myself roasted in this thing. I can get up when I can. Regular guy, right? Wrong. Reality check. Just give me one second. Hey, boys and girls, this is looks familiar. Ringing the bells. Jeez, isn't that fun? Maybe I should just use a phaser on your ass. Gotta love these damn things. Hey, used to be time you could take these things off and, well, actually you can't, just have to use a Phillips screwdriver on them, but still. Nice, aren't they? Then again, I prefer the Aldi, but goody. If the damn thing stayed on there long enough. Yeah, no. Okay, let's see. Uh we have to uh I guess or something on here. Blows up. Well that's no fun. That means I gotta take the damn thing apart and, f- and fry someone. A little button on here. Don't mess with the guy with a phaser. Gets worse, doesn't it? Okay, you're imagining me pulling up the rest of the stuff out of this damn box. 
Okay. Maybe I should. Get a reading on you. The Feinberg, they call it. Fred Feinberg. He was a champion stuff like this. Okay, let's see how the... Well, that doesn't work. Okay. Well, I'm supposed to be making weird ass noises anyway. And I'm supposed to shut itself off. Well, eventually, when the battery scale itself. What other kind of nerd stuff that we can put out here that can drive people crazy? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Well, let's see. I phased you do once with this damn thing. Ah. Meet the mini me. And a broken mini me. But still, it's supposed to come out somehow, and it's supposed to. Uh... Ah, there we go. stuff that we had to deal with for Trekkies and wanted to deal with all the damn time. And yet now, I can't even get this damn thing to turn off. I know, some fans are going to say, this is a collectible item. Yeah, yes, it is collectible items at this point over here. Shut up. Let's turn the damn thing off one way or another. Without breaking this thing, too. Well, I can always put new batteries in the thing. Trying to get the damn thing to work here. I know, I know. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this. Save the damn battery power. Okay, now it don't work because I took out the batteries. But this is the kind of stuff that was built by scratch. Every one of these damn things. <sighs> we are so crazy with these damn things, I swear. And yet, with these items that we have here, A trick he's showing off his wear left and right. You gotta love this insanity, I swear. But it is insane. Come on, it the whole damn thing is insane in the first place. I mean, now I gotta turn this damn thing here and take a bio reading of someone. I love these damn things, I swear. Are they cute? Collectibles. Battery operated. Things popping up in the seventies and eight actually in the well model kits in the seventies. Gotta love Ravel for those guys. They'll take the items and uh, mass copy them like crazy, but only to a point where people can actually enjoy these things. And they can enjoy these things. My problem is how much. All right, I know if you're looking for the. For the flip, aren't you? You're like waiting for the tricky flip. Of course. I missed the one that actually has a clock in dancing. Well, so much for the tricky flip. You had to be a Trekkie if you had to do these things. I mean, you had to 
practice your butt off doing these kind of things. So naturally, yes, I have a box of this stuff. It gets worse than that. It gets worse than that. I will show you how worse it becomes. Let's just say, for example, you want to wear the damn costumes. No, I don't have the costumes, okay? I'm too damn old and too damn fat for the damn things. No, I'm not exactly too damn old. I'm just too damn fat for the damn things. However, however, you got to watch out for that finger. It's going to go off one of these here days. This is not the show. Well, basically, this is to show something. Show what kind of a meatball a person can actually get himself into. And yes, I did see that used the term meatball. Because, or frankly, I am one. So. Okay. And there was supposed to have been the rank. And the God knows God, what else we've got here. A lot of collection, isn't it? You think I'm going to be pouring it all over my damn table? You're crazy. But this is to show you. Well, sometimes the fandom can go a little crazy over Disney as well. And there's a wrong about fandom at this point over here. The only thing that's wrong about it is going and saying what the damn worship. That's the thing that's going on these days. What brings me over to a point where people happen to argue about the merits and demerits of Star Trek. As William Shatner had said in a Saturday Night skit, Saturday Night Live skit, people, it's just a science fiction show. Get a life. To say that to a fellow Trekkie or a fellow Trekker at this point over here is to invite the Klingon Death Stare. Where would I really apologize for this lack of eyes? Turn myself into Marty Feldman there. What drives me crazy at this point over here is the absolute worship, and I have to admit it, for a long while, yes. If there had been a cult of Star Trek, I would have been part of the damn thing. If I haven't been feeling like I was part of it right now as it is, even up to this point. I have to argue with fellow science fiction nut jobs out there concerning about the reality-based and what they consider fantasy. And when, when they start publishing books arguing about the merits of Star Trek politics, of economics, of what it meant to be part of a federation, of are they communist? Are they socialist? Are they capitalist? What are they? Yeah, there is a guy's article out there. It's, I'm somewhat responding to its point over here, which brings me to this long diatribe. Usually I'm going off of other things left and right. But this one was striking home because I saw this guy's article several years ago online. And I remembered part of it in the first place. And I remembered part of the arguments that they had going on on Facebook and other social medias regarding the the merits of being a Trek fan or having the, uh, the economy of the United Federation of Planets. And for some people, it don't work. And other people, they want it to work. But comparing it to what kind of government system we have, and to compare it to what their government system is supposed to be, and how Roddenberry had envisioned it, to workability and not workability at this point over here. I mean, will it work? Will it not work? And the problem is, it was a fly in the pants. It was just... All of it was just flying the pants at this point over here. It was coming out of his damn head at this point over here. I don't know, if, and I don't know if there was any essays written by him to thoroughly examine his own works to see whether or not if the reality and the theories were actually working. For me, I'm almost looking at every episode popping out 
And although there was certain entertainment value in it, and there was a lot of messaging in it, there was a lot of messaging in it. And the problem is, a lot of people have taken it too much to heart at this point. Entertainment is one thing, but some of the social messages were very hard spoken in a, in a creative way where we had to look at it and examine ourselves. We're talking about the damn economics, and then you're talking about the political ramifications of the damn economics at this point over here. I mean, good lord. It's better than if we have to have economy uh, that's being screwed over left and right because of our own reality taking place and taking shape. Of different situations, different political, social, and biological affecting us these days. Yeah, sorry about the shaking there. It's just me hitting the damn table. And trying to understand all of this, trying to understand any of this damn thing. It's gotten to a point where I don't even understand the damn thing anymore. I don't understand where the hell the fans are coming from anymore. Some of them seem like nice, pleasant, intelligent people. Until I hear some of the stuff coming out of their mouth, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in trouble now. Either they mutated or they evolved or something happened to where common everyday language and common everyday thinking has that escaped us entirely? Are we still off in the altruistic futuristic plane of the Federation that we cannot deal with the reality of the self. But the problem is, when Star Trek was created, it was trying to talk about the reality of the self of that time period, of what Roddenberry has seen and experienced, and it still carries over to this time period. Okay, we get that fact, okay? But the universe in itself expanded to a hell of a lot of borders to where we are at the form of worshiping this thing. We are. And our lexicons, and our conversations, our postings, our garb. And now in dealing with biological contaminations, we have to make it interesting and pretty looking. Face masks. Do you think I'd be swearing off Star Trek at this point over here? And I'll think and tell you for a long while. I tried to to swear off science fiction because science fiction to me was my life, my realm, my world. It somewhat became a religion for me. All right, to put it bluntly, it, it was a religion to me. One cannot one cannot worship two gods. There has to be one. Paraphrase the first commandment in the Bible. My God was Gene Wright and Mary. My luck, he's probably roasting in hell. Like every one of us Trek fans. They sold our soul to a damn idealistic plane of existence. Or maybe he's in heaven still trying to rework that place into a federation of sorts. Who knows? But I have to take major steps back and understand what the hell I've been doing to myself all these times, all these years. I had gotten myself to a point where I got this illusion of being a fan back in the 90s. And somewhere in my earlier videos I was talking about this. I had become... Uh, a fan off of one particular radio show that started off in a local area of San Fernando Valley who took off with the fandom got to local then state and then national callers and they had a eclectic group of people there Two people work in the industry, and one person who is connected to these people one way or another. Got to the point where 
got broadcasted on their cable radio network at the time. You see the advertisers on the screen. But the radio programs are being generated and locally in San Fernando Valley. But it was being whoever got into the network, actually it was a cable network, was listening to cable cable radio network and uh they were seeing they were seeing their own shows come alive. Now, the thing is, I was a groupie. I was a fan. I started hearing about this thing, and it was already ongoing already for maybe maybe a few years, on a local radio station, and I supported them by becoming one of their groupies, so to speak, one of their outpost commanders. Hardly ever I, I ever mention names on my own videos. I don't want any trademarks. And I don't want anybody blasting at me. But sometimes I have to. Joyce Mason. God rest her soul. She created a talk track. Put it on KAEV, 670 AM. Glendale, California. Probably back in the late 80s or early to mid-90s. And she was trained to demonstrate the positive energy of being a Trek fan. She had two production guys from Paramount Studios who worked on the Star Trek uh, shows left and right. Next Generation all the way through, probably Voyager. And during that time, it was the next generation and being developed in Deep Space Nine. And her show was getting more and more popular. It's explained over here. I was trying to get people involved in the damn thing by doing the word of mouth. That's what Outpost Commander does. He's supposed to be getting a bunch of junk from her, and I did get a bunch of paper junk. That's about it. The only thing she could have worn was stationary. Everything else, she had to get a large amount of sponsors and donations in order to make her marketing campaign work, and it didn't. It fell through. But the message concerning about fandom was being generated a hell of a lot stronger. B. Joe Trimbo, a long time ago, and her husband, started the original fandom for Star Trek as part of the Star Trek Welcome Committee. Trying to do to save our trying to save Star Trek fan generation movement there back in the late sixties when Star Trek was going to be ending after the first season and she rallied a lot of fans to march to write letters to harangue the networks and Paramount and they got a second season and she did it again barely got it the third season but couldn't do the fourth season. I guess Paramount and the networks got sick and tired of the damn thing. They didn't realize there was a huge group of people following this whole, sh- this whole show across the country. They didn't realize it, that they started popping up conventions left and right. That they had stars coming out there with permissions from the studios and networks to make their appearances, to do the publicities. And stuff generated. Well, a few decades later, Joyce is one of those people still carrying the torch at this point. But a young upstart kid comes in uh, into play. Yeah, a kid, because I'm in my 20s. What the hell did I know? What the hell did I know about anything during that time? I wanted to be involved. I wanted to be something, part of something that meant a damn to me. I couldn't be involved in my own damn church. No, I had to be involved in science fiction. So... I called the stations quite a number of times. Commander Weaver. Talk to Outpost 53. I'd gotten to the point where I convinced my mother, who was trying to run a bookkeeping income tax business, she wanted to get more publicity, so I told her to buy into a spot. 
she only, Joyce only ran it once. Couldn't run it any other times, just once. Got her some business, but not much. Not many fans would listen for the commercials. I mean, if they did, they were just bypassing it. But somehow my mother had to make an attempt anyway. She had better luck with mixers over at the uh, Chamber of Commerce's than she did with the Trek thing. Uh, well, that was a gamble anyway. Got to the point where Joyce was becoming more and more popular and uh, different than the company was still based out of her home, but broadcasting was from Glendale, then switched over to Sun Valley, where Cable Radio Network was stationed. Time Warner Cable is that work. And after a while, they've got established and situated over there. I decided I was going to try doing these things. So what the hell? I got invited once. I was so overwhelmed and so enthralled, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I wish to God I had recordings of that damn thing. I was going nuts. But apparently a lot of people liked me, and apparently they did too for a time. Because I got invited to a second time. But then again, I guess Joyce was noticing more that I was becoming more and more of a pain in the ass than she realized. Maybe I was. Maybe she was right. Maybe I turned into a damn fanatic at that point. I don't know. Maybe a converted believer or follower. Who knows? All I know is I thought I found my calling at this point over here. Maybe I could join these guys every single week and be an enthusiastic fan. The general manager at the time wanted me back because he liked the ratings. Joyce was jealous because I took their way of thunder. And I imagine I made the other two guys uncomfortable as well. Third time's the charm. And then she starts making comments on the air... <clears throat> right when they made, when I took a break. And somehow the comments got aired. And general manager decided that was it. I guess the general manager had a discussion with Joyce on this after my second. I mean, it must have been within a three week period, three or four week period. I know there's a hell of a lot of missing information in the in the whole experience, and those two gentlemen out there who are connected to Joyce can actually help correct me on that one. I'd appreciate it. See, that was a decent woman, I think, but there was a hell of a lot of jealousy being created during that time. I was an over enthused and zealous late twenty something fan. I was a sycophant. Or maybe I was a mid twenties, actually. I was mid mid twenties during that time. And I was crazy, apparently. Well, maybe crazy in my head during that time. But the thing of it is, I was a fan stealing her thunder. And she had built up the show. She had tried to build up her audience. And then with a few choice words and a few selected things that I don't even remember what the hell she said, but that were said, and that night, the show got pulled permanently. Yeah. I remember this from time to time. I have to remember how much craziness fandom can be. And it can lead you down to a pretty damn dark road if you're not careful with it. You can do other things that... You can do a lot of things, a lot of damage that nobody has picked up on. And that's scary. But this is fandom. I have people talking about other shows left and right and let them talk about the shows left and right. My response regarding all of this was, and still is, they're just shows. 
we have to put things in perspective. But the thing is, some of these shows are giving other people some kind of weird-ass hope for a future. And maybe I've become more sanguine about it, and maybe I've become more jaundiced about it. Because I'm keeping up with the reality more and more, and I don't see my future being presented in a Star Trekian way. People said about 20 or 30 years down the road we're going to have the quote-unquote first contact. We're going to have aliens from the sky come down and visit us. One guy is going to be developing a new warp drive to leap beyond, to borrow information from the movie Star Trek First Contact. And it's a hell of a movie to see, I tell you. We were talking about the life of Zephyr and Cochrane a little bit. We wanted to see dollar signs. But they tried to do the Zephyr and Cochrane back in the 60s, and it was a hell of a different character then and different actor, and different things talking about this guy. He wanted to die out in space. He was getting tired of it. Two different viewpoints of what a character was supposed to have been in the first place being interpreted. <laughs> a lot of fans have torn those things apart left and right, but they still enjoyed the movie. I know, because it was still a box office sit. So I'll try to put this into conclusion at this point. We all have our things. We all have our fandoms. We all have our genres that we like, that we worship left and right, that can drive us insane with all the damn collecting we've done. We just spend millions and millions of dollars. But in the final analysis, does it actually help us out a great deal? Maybe. I don't know. Does it give us perspective in things? Possibly. Does it give us hope for what future lies ahead. Maybe. What it gave me? An empty pocketbook. But being young and idealistic back then, it gave me hopes and dreams. Glimpses of what things could have been or should have been. It wasn't. To put it from a quote from Star Trek to Rotha Khan, probably to paraphrase it. B.B. Bash is talking to William Shatner, Carl Marcus, and Captain uh, Admiral Kirk talking to each other. She goes, Tell me what you're feeling. He's trying to tell him about Khan. And then tell him about a world that he's shown. How am I feeling? He answers. Old, worn out. Let me show you something that will make you feel young as when the world was new. She offers him a hand and shows him Genesis inside a deep planet where things were possible through science. But the creation of life, she goes, can I cook or can't I? The philosophical reasons that could be argued at a different time concerning your path of playing God. But sometimes the implications are kind of clear during that time. And they are. We just have to keep seeing them that way. A lot of soul searching, a lot of deep thought, a lot more audio recordings to get them off the damn chest. A lot more explorations of our own heart and soul at this point over here to see if we're still alive, still breathing, still taking, still have a pulse going on. I think I still got a pulse too. still going on. But I had to explore this, and I had to talk about this, because it still motivated me. Despite what's been going on in our day and age, it would drive Roddenberry crazy during this time. Not to mention his own family crazy, if they still want to continue this the Trek revolution or evolution, shall we call it. And what about the economics of Star Trek? What the guys write about the books about the economics of Star Trek? Let them tear the damn thing apart left and right. It's all academic. It's all fandom stuff. Does it happen to deal with anything about me? 
I collected a bunch of Star Trek pins left and right when I can and when I feel like it. I collected the toys because I wanted to collect them as a collector. I collected the mask because that was needed for COVID-19. I wore the clothing because they fit and also because I'm still a diehard Trek fan no matter what the hell happens. So maybe I am going to hell for this. I sure as hell ain't going to heaven, that's for sure. Not for the most part. If there was a beaming station, would I have been able to deal with the realm of Star Trek? Would I have been able to deal with the Federation of Planets with the Starfleet? Would that make myself a good officer? Maybe if you asked me about it when I was in my early 20s, it would be a different story altogether. I'd be wanting to wear a uniform in the worst possible way. I'm going to be turning double nickel in January. I'm going to be turning double nickel. A lot of diehard fans are in the 70s and 80s and 90s at this point. Giving their lives for a concept like this. I'm still too damn young. I was born the same time as Star Trek was. When it got broadcasted for the first time in the same year I was born. I'm as old as the show broadcasted. And I still see the relevance back then and today. Would I be able to fit in a universe like that? Maybe. I'm not technically minded, but I sure probably would. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to deal with today. That's all I got. That's all I got. So, I hope you guys have a good one today. Me, I still got my ills, wills, chills, pills, and scratches and ratches, and God knows what else going on. My own moral condition, if I actually had bones as medical expertise, I could have been treated already and lived a nice, healthy life. Or maybe Dr. Catherine Pulaski, or Crusher, or even Dr. Flux. Or maybe the holographic doctor, or Jillian Bashir. I'm sorry, I got grow up with, grew up with the old guard. Now, if you start asking me about Star Trek Discovery, I'm still discovering it more and more. So don't ask me about that just yet. All I know is what I know about. So the usual customary formality of a Vulcan would say, live long and prosper. I usually insulted the living crap out of people saying, live short and die.